Welcome back everybody, High Tech Lab here. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about this mini battery pack that uses seven Nissan Leaf cells. And I've actually been using this in my off-grid setup. I made a pretty cool video a couple days ago showing how it shares the power nicely. There should be a card in the top corner of this video and you can watch that if you haven't yet. But getting started, I have a golf cart battery charger and this is connected in temporarily. I made, it's not the most kosher thing, but it's connected nonetheless um, through to an Anderson connector. So this, this pack has a gray Anderson connector on the side so you can make nice easy connections. It's got a circuit breaker on the front and a voltage meter. We're gonna talk about this voltage meter toward the end of the video. Um, but I do have my Fluke 116 connected on with the clip probes here and it's just measuring the voltage on this battery coming out and you'll note that this says 58.09 volts call it 58.1 volts that is the full charge capacity of this battery pack now one thing i'm going to do is turn this golf cart battery charger off and then back on and i'm going to show you the way that this battery pack is actually safe in a way that if for some reason you were to over voltage the input of this pack it would be totally okay because the BMS that's built into this takes care of protecting the cells and keeping them from getting overcharged. So once this charger goes through a detection cycle, it's gonna start charging and the amperage is gonna go up pretty rapidly. It's starting out at about three amps and the voltage is climbing and this is actually somewhat outside of the range but you may be able to tell that the 116 is picking up slightly different than the panel meter. We're charging at about 12 amps and you can see the voltage is climbing. And what you'll see here in a second is that once this BMS says, hey, the, all these cells are full, it's gonna stop allowing charge to go into this battery and you'll see this voltage spike because the charger is putting out power and it's hitting that BMS and think of it as a closed valve and it's not letting it go through. So more or less the pressure, or in this case voltage, is not going through into the battery and it spikes up as you can kind of imagine would happen with a water pipe. So you can see the voltage just spiked up to about 63 volts and the amp meter went down to zero but this panel meter still says 58.1 volts. And the reason for that is because the BMS totally shut out the charging and this charger spiked up in voltage, but the BMS protected this pack so we don't have any issues, which is actually really nice because that allows us to use a charger that may not have the best set points. And it's gonna make sure that this battery pack doesn't get fried by excessive voltage. If I unplug this charger now, you can see the voltage drops back down to 57.96, which is a totally safe voltage because that BMS has reopened that valve and now is allowing power to come out through the Anderson connector and it's being read by my Fluke multimeter. So now I have water running through this dummy load. I'm reading about 58.1 volts. My meter is ready to record, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the record button and start it. And now I can just connect on my test load and we'll begin our capacity test. And we can see we have 50.8 amps coming out of this battery and our voltage has dropped slightly to 56.2 volts. Now I'm gonna run this and log when the low voltage alarm kicks on and then finally log when the battery cutout takes place. I've made up this cable with some Anderson connectors and it has a shunt on it. This is a 100 amp, 100 millivolt shunt. And I use this for testing purposes because I have banana plugs here on the shunt that I can plug in with some leads into my multimeter. If I were using an inverter to take the power out of this battery pack, you have some AC waveforms going down the DC lines. And I'll show this in a future video when I have a scope but it actually can cause this test to be inaccurate using the method of multimeter to calculate the amount of amp hours in and out. It's a heating element for a water heater and I have another Anderson connector on it. These are really convenient connectors to use for testing, but I could feed cold water in through this side and have hot water come out this side 
and it's going to make a effective dump load to get rid of the energy for this capacity test. And the nice part is with that constant flow of water, this remains at a very constant resistance. Here I have my test load, which I can simply open and close this water valve to allow different amounts of water through. So I can set this to a very fine trickle and that water is all going back into the water storage tank that the hose is then returning the water into the tank and it's got quite a slow trickle and this tank is actually nearly completely full of water. I have booster pumps here in my pump room that then suck the water out of the tanks and pressurize it to 60 to 70 psi and it then comes out of the hose and goes to my test station. So looking up close and personal with this logging multimeter, it's currently set on a millivolt DC reading and it's showing some noise, but that's normal. If I hit the save button, I can select record and from there I can set the sample duration. Right now I have it set to a one second sample duration and a recording duration for two hours and 47 minutes, which should be plenty enough to discharge this battery pack. I can then go ahead and hit start, which I'm not going to do yet, and it will begin this test. Now what I'm going to do is start recording this, and then shortly after plug in my test load, and this should record all of the power going in and out of this battery pack. However, in this case we're only discharging, so it'll only record the power being discharged. Okay, so I'm about 45 minutes into this test. I've recorded 2,750 samples. I'm at 48.4 volts approximately and falling somewhat rapidly. I'm waiting for the low voltage alarm to cut in, but so far this pack has been performing quite well and I'm actually amazed that these used cells that these are made up of are performing this well. I just crossed 45 volts and now have the low battery alarm going off on this pack. So it should be no time before this battery pack hits its low voltage cutout. So the BMS just cut this out. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my recording and turn off the breaker on this pack so it's a little less annoying. And now I can plug my meter into the computer and view that in fluke view forms so I can calculate the exact capacity of this battery. So I'm back inside and I have my laptop and my meter and this is connected with the infrared cable to USB so now I can pull in all this data here in fluke view forms. I've got screen capture running so I can go and select get meter data and get the meter data now and it'll take a second and I can see this is from today April 30th 2020 and I can simply select export data and it's going to go through this process of getting the data from the meter. It's going to take a minute because there are quite a few data points in here to pull from and it needs to download all of that through this infrared to USB cable. And once it's collected all of that meter data, now it's going to request a name and it's going to save these as a CSV file. So by default it has battery 8, which is the name that it had when it was still inside of the meter. And I'm okay with that, so I'm just going to click save and it's going to save these into a folder on my computer. So now that I have all of this data opened up in Excel, I can actually start to crunch the numbers. What I'm going to do is look at the stop time and the start time of this test and these times correlate to the sample times here in the table below. For example, this sample right here on line 18 started at the 19th minute and 11th second based on the start time here at the top. At 619 and 11 seconds is when the actual power was passing through where I had 47 amps DC. So what I'm going to do is copy this result to my clipboard and paste it here on the side and go all the way down to the bottom and get the time of my last sample. So here on line 3166, I can take my timestamp and bring that back up to the top because I can see that this is where the current dropped to about 2 amps and that's when the BMS cut out and no longer was passing power through to the heating element. So I'm going to take this timestamp and copy it up to the top and then I can right click and select format cells and set this as hours, minutes, and seconds. 
So then here I can subtract this bottom number from this top number and get my total duration, which was 52 minutes and 27 seconds. Once I've made all those replacements, I can go into a spare box here on the right and goes equals average and then select the same box where my sample started, which in this case was line 18. And then I can go back down to the bottom of my document where I made my last sample, which was column 3,155. And now I can plug all of that information into my formula. And what that gave me was an average of 46.6019 amps for 52 minutes. What I need to do next is convert my 52 minutes and 27 seconds into how much of an hour that was in percentage. So in this case, I'm going to multiply 52 by 60, which gives me 3,120. And then I'm gonna take 3,120 and add the 27 seconds. And that is the amount of seconds, and that's the amount of seconds it took to do this capacity test. I'm then gonna take that many seconds, which is 3,147, and divide that by 3,600, because there's 3,600 seconds in one hour, and that will give me 87.4% of an hour. I can then multiply that by my average current, which is going to give me 40.73 amp hours. So that's what I got out of this test, and again, my average current was 46.6 amps, so that's a relatively high C rate. But if you consider this were in an electric vehicle like these leaf cells normally come in, that's actually a reasonable discharge rate. So if I compare that to the specifications on BigBattery.com, they're specifying it as 31.25 amp hours. I'm actually getting 40.73 amp hours. So it has a pretty significantly higher capacity than it's advertised as. That's good, that means you get more than you pay for. So I've brought this battery pack back into my electrical room and connected it back onto the bus bars. And I didn't get it on camera, but I had about 70 amps running through this BMS and into the battery from my other CALB cells. And it brought the bus voltage down a little bit. But here in no time, my generator is gonna kick in and charge this back up. Ultimately, this is a pretty good battery pack because it exceeded its capacity by nearly 25%. So yeah, even though this capacity is a little smaller than what these batteries are originally spec'd for, it's still quite a bit of power in a small form factor, and it'll work great in off-grid applications where the excess weight of the batteries doesn't matter because it's just sitting on a floor. If this battery were twice as heavy, other than the minor nuisance to get it in place the first time, it really wouldn't matter because it's just going to sit there for years. And so ultimately, I would recommend these batteries if you're looking for something as an alternative to lithium ion because these actually do not contain lithium. They're an NMC type chemistry. But yeah, if you have any questions on this battery pack and want to learn more about them, leave it in the comments below. And be sure to share this video with any of your friends. And if you're interested in purchasing one of these battery packs, there's an affiliate link in the description below that can help support the channel.